my honor to welcome all of you to the fourth annual Roosevelt Robeson Lecture at Bonham College. The lecture's purpose is to feature each year a speaker from the agricultural community who explores issues, challenges, and innovations in this vital industry. It is altogether proper that such a lecture should exist at Bonham College. First, of course, the college sits in the midst of one of the world's great red baskets. Also, many of the college's alumni and friends, many of whom are with us this evening, are involved in various aspects of agriculture and are, in fact, national and international leaders in agricultural issues. The Wisbell Robeson Lecture complements several other food and agriculture-related initiatives at the college. For almost a decade, college faculty and students have maintained a garden and farm near the campus that is an essential part of our teaching and learning experience. Mama's innovative global food security triad allows students to explore issues in agriculture and food security from a multidisciplinary perspective in anthropology, biology, and economics. Other members of our faculty are engaged in additional curricular innovations in agriculture, including, for example, the application of data science to agriculture. Monmouth was the only liberal arts college on the charter signatory of President's United to Solve Hunger, a United Nations sponsored initiative to bring the energy of colleges and universities from around the world to address hunger. At Monmouth, we believe that feeding the world's people is an all hands on deck enterprise, and that engaging our students in those issues and preparing them to contribute and lead is one of our most exciting opportunities. The Wisco Robeson Lecture, one of the college's most distinguished lectures, was established in 2016 through a generous gift from Gene Gettys Robeson, a 1960 graduate of the college. Robeson and her late husband Don, who was a 1954 Monmouth graduate, operated their farm in Warren County from 1960 to 1996. Jean carried on a family legacy of women in farming stretching back to the 1880s. Please join me in thanking Jean and her current husband, Louis Gould, and other members of Jean's of their family who are with us tonight for making this possible. <laughs> and it's now my pleasure to invite one of our most distinguished faculty members. Petty Professor Emeritus of Political Economy and Commerce, Ken McMillan, to please come to the podium. Ken. Thank you. 
and 60. And then they farmed. And they provided significant leadership and involvement in agriculture and in the community for several decades. When Don passed away, Jean wanted to create a fitting memorial to honor Don's family and her family, and in particular, the productive and unique farm economy of this county, this area, and the country. And she wanted to focus on all of the many, many different roles that agriculture in this country <coughs> plays in seeking to feed our country and the world. And then she created the Whistler Wilson Lecture. So, as Jean makes her way to the stage, um, let's all recall that she established this lecture and let's express our gratitude and appreciation for that as well as the hard work she continues to do to ensure that this lecture is a success. Jean. Very cool. Uh, 
Uh, how about student or somebody connected with Monmouth administration or student? Okay, very cool. Um, it's Veterans Day. How about uh, our veterans? And here's the other thing. I, I'm also a veteran, and, and I, I think this is actually even more important. Also, the veteran spouses, would you guys raise your hands too? And I'd love to just recognize them. The spouse is the one job that's actually quite, uh, quite a bit harder than the actual veteran themselves sometimes. So never forget to appreciate those people. Uh, okay, so um, what we're going to do tonight is really fun, and I would say this panel is so distinguished, I don't really know what I'm doing up here on the stage. It must be because I'm family, but it's definitely an honor for me to be up here, and we're going to go through a little photo journey today. A little different than the previous three lectures, I think it'll be a lot of fun. I have a lot of photos, and what I'm going to talk about today is not meant to be something prescriptive. I'm going to share my story. I'm going to share the story of how we got started, what we've done, what we've built, but we are far from arrived. Uh, we're very much still in process. We're still learning every single day. Um, I've learned actually quite a bit just from being here and being around some of the great farmers that are in your county. Um, so don't take any of this as me um, saying this is how it should be done or this is the only way to do things. I'm sharing simply the story of us coming up in San Diego County um, and how we've been doing things and some things that we've had success with. And I think I'll probably share some failures too. Any of you farmers out there, you know, um, we get a little of both, right? So, this is our farm in San Diego County. Uh, the title of the lecture is What Are You Waiting For? Agripreneurship. Agripreneurship is like entrepreneurship. <clears throat> My story starts in downtown Seattle, Washington. That's where I was born and raised. City kid through and through, fully urban, um, grew up playing sports and just not thinking about food farming or food production ever. Um, it wasn't until much later in life that I even thought about what I was going to put in my body and how that would affect me. I came down to college uh, in Southern California, which is where I met my wife, Lindsay, the, the folks in the front row know. She's the rock. She's a, she's a very, very cool lady. Uh, and we met in college and fell in love, and I thought I would stay in Southern California forever. God had other plans. Uh, the next step for me was shipping off to Quantico, Virginia, and then eventually overseas to Iraq. Uh, for a tour in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Had a fantastic time, to be honest, in the military. Uh, really, really, really loved serving my country and the camaraderie that came from being with the guys and being in a mission that we really cared deeply about. But something started to happen. During my time as a college athlete and then also in the Marine Corps, I started to get some health problems. So everything from my ankles, my knees, my hips, I can reach my nose, um, this wasn't combat related or stress induced, it was weird. I had grown up my whole life being a healthy athletic kid and never having problems like this, but all of a sudden I found myself waking up two or three times a night. I found myself having a you know, need to take Motrin. We call, we call Motrin vitamin M in the Marine Corps because it's something we take on a pretty regular basis. We call it vitamin M. Uh, I found myself needing that quite a bit because of a lot of inflammation in my joints. Um, Around that time, this is 2007, um, some friends in the Marine Corps were getting into this thing called paleo. Anybody heard of the paleo thing or the CrossFit thing? All right, the younger folks have, which is weird because it's just bringing back what was once. So the idea of paleo is eating like a hunter gatherer, really going back to your ancestors. And I like to say eat like my great grandma probably ate. Real foods, whole foods, things that you can actually pronounce, things that are on the outsides of the grocery store, not the inside. And to my surprise, because again, I'd never connected the way that I felt with what I actually put into my body. So I was really surprised that I started to feel a whole lot better. All these weird little symptoms of chronic inflammation, fatigue, and brain fog, they all seemed to kind of go away. And there was no drugs involved. There was no extra exercise or anything like that. It was just the food that I was putting in my body. And it wasn't anything super fancy. It was just real food. Um, that was the first time in my entire life, at 23, 24 years old, young lieutenant in the Marine Corps, that I realized, wow, what I eat actually matters. And so we went on this journey. Uh, my family, uh, not quite yet, but my family went on this journey of really diving into the food that we're eating. And we looked at it, um, and we started studying it. So after feeling a lot better, I started going, I'm a little bit skeptical, right? So we're spending all this extra money now. We're buying this grass-fed, free-range, 
organic, cage-free, biodynamic, antibiotic-free. The list goes on for like 20 minutes with these fancy labels that they're spending all this extra money for. And I kind of sort of get this weird feeling that not all is well with the world. So we're going to go into that in just a second. About halfway through, I got out of the Marine Corps and I uh, jumped into accounting. This is my only joke of the night. <laughs> you hear the joke about the interesting accountant. No, me neither. Um, jokes aside, I loved my time in accounting. I think it was 100% critical to the success that we've been able to have now. Um, I know my numbers, I know my books. That's really what's allowed us to actually go and be successful um, in business. Without knowing that, I've seen farms come and go by the wayside. You can have the most sustainable, regenerative, organic practices, but if you're not making money, you're not sustainable, right? So I just bring that up because we are out of college, and I highly value my small liberal arts degree from Concordia University in Irvine, where I studied accounting, went on to the Marine Corps, and then made a stop in as a CPA for about three years, and to this day, I think that's some of the best experience and foundation that I had. Okay, me and my wife are buying this fancy chicken, and in our minds, this free-range organic cage-free pasture-raised chicken looks something like this, right? Now you guys are going to laugh when you see this because you're farm people and you understand what real agricultural production looks like. But me and my family were really upset when we found out that the free-range organic cage-free antibiotic-free chickens that we were buying looked a lot more like this on the farm. And it actually looked a lot more like this on the inside of the farm. So to our surprise, this farm right here, 600 foot long, 40 foot wide, and again, I'll stop, time out real quick. I'm not mocking this production style at all. This is a valid production style. This is the way things are done, and that's totally fine. But I was surprised to learn that this farm could be labeled as organic, as long as the feed inside there is organic. It could be labeled as free range, as long as those 25,000 chickens had a little door that opens to the outside. It doesn't matter if they ever go outside. The key is that they had access to the outdoors, and that makes them free range. It could definitely be called no, no hormones, no antibiotics, even if they received antibiotics for their entire life. The antibiotic residue that's in the meat has to test below the FDA's parts per billion protocol, and that's antibiotic free chicken. I didn't know this, so. <coughs> GMO free, as long as the feed that's inside of there is GMO free, it's GMO free. So that $30 chicken that we're buying at the grocery store, Whole Foods, and really trying to spend whatever we needed to to get the best product possible. It was coming from something that looked like this, and the reality is we thought it was looking something more like that. So call it uninformed consumer, but we were really surprised to find that out. We hit the point where it was either figure out where your food's coming from and, and uh, learn and get to know the farmers, or stop eating meat altogether. That's basically the alternative that we came down to. Uh, these are my two brothers-in-law, Rob and Jeff, and my father-in-law, Tom. We were sitting around um, joking in 2012. Again, farm, not on the radar. City kid, Seattle, urban, not thinking about farming. Just trying to find good food for my family. Uh, that guy, second to left, Rob, we were sitting around joking. 2012, oh, wouldn't it be funny to get some chickens for the backyard? Oh, ha ha, wouldn't that be great? We see them running around. This is Southern California. It's not a normal thing to do there. Uh, it was a big joke. Well, Rob goes, he disappears from the room. He comes back about 10 minutes later and he goes, hey, guys, I got great news. Uh, I just went online and I ordered 50 chicks and they're going to be here uh, delivery in two weeks. And we all went, whoa, 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 stop, no, you didn't, you didn't. We don't have a chicken, we don't have anything, right? We have no idea how to do this. Um, but, sure enough, got those first 50 chicks. We had literally no idea what we were doing. Uh, jumped on YouTube for some of the younger folks in the room. You know, you can actually learn quite a bit on YouTube. Um, watch some videos, how to do it, how to, blah, 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 and basically raise the birds the way that we thought that they would be raised out in nature. So outside, eating grass and bugs and seeds and worms. Didn't give any antibiotics because, frankly, we didn't know what antibiotics to even give them. We were fully flying by the seat of our pants, admittedly, having no idea with what we were doing. But... It was an interesting thing that happened because those first few birds started to grow. And back in those days, we had something called Facebook. And I thought, as the serial entrepreneur, I thought, man, wouldn't that be interesting to list some of these products online for sale and see if anybody's interested? Who knows? Probably not. My family's going to eat them all. Uh, we're going to go and crawl and do that whole thing. But that's fine. We'll just put them in the freezer and my family will eat them all. But wouldn't it be interesting if 
One person out of the, you know, my friends was interested in buying one of these chickens. That'd be, that'd be weird. Put the first 50 birds up, um, all 50, pre-sold in a two-week period. And all we did was just on, um, we just posted pictures of the process, showed how we were doing it. Again, nothing we do is perfect. This is not meant to be prescriptive, but we're just being super transparent about it. Uh, all 50 birds sold out within the first two weeks. So they were still, you know, chicken, the broilers at all, they were still in the yay high. And we had another, about six weeks or so to go on the process, but we collected all these deposits, thousands of dollars in deposits. And I'm sitting here as a, you know, serial entrepreneur, now in grad school at UCLA, studying entrepreneurship. The entrepreneurship is now sitting underneath my nose. I haven't quite connected you yet. But the next month, we went on to do uh, 100, and then a month after that, we did 200, and then a few months later, we tried 400, and then 800, and then 1,000, that's a day. Um, it's become a company. So our company, one of the two companies we're going to talk about tonight is Primal Pastures. Primal Pastures has grown now to become one of the premier pasture-raised livestock sellers online. And we sell nationwide. We'll get into some more of that stuff here pretty soon. We were really mentored by this man. Anybody know who the guy is in the green shirt? Raise your hand if, you, if this guy looks familiar to you at all. Very cool. I like that. That was more than I thought. Uh, Joel Salatin. Really well known, uh, famous farmer in Virginia, in Shenandoah, uh, in the Shenandoah Valley. He's pioneered this model of putting animals outside on pasture. And the fundamental difference of what Joel has really pioneered, well, we say pioneered, he would say he's just copying nature, he didn't pioneer anything. But that livestock likes to move. And all kinds of interesting things happen when we move animals out of, uh, of a stationary system and put them in a mobile system. And so Joel has these floorless, it's kind of hard to see the light, but there's no floor on that chicken pen. So they have shade, they have food, they have water, they basically have this little mini broiler house, but the bedding underneath them is the pasture. And so the birds are foraging for grasses and bugs and seeds and worms every day, supplemented with that good corn and soybean feed, but they're eating that all day long and they're moving to a new spot every single day. So you can see all those chicken coops in the background on Joel's farm in Virginia. He gets out there with his guys and he moves us every single day to fresh pasture. Really interesting things start to happen. We're going to dive into it. As we got into this, I got really excited about a term that's very hot right now. If you haven't, well, let's, let's pull real quick. Who's heard the term regenerative agriculture? More than Joel Salatin, but still less than half. Regenerative agriculture, if you go to the food shows, if you go around to the uh, agricultural stuff, it's probably number one trend right now. Uh, regenerative agriculture is the idea that our farming can actually be beneficial to the environment, to the soil. We can increase soil health and fertility through the way we farm. We're getting away from the idea of just damage control, trying to do the least harm, or the idea of sustainability. Which sustainability, if you think about it, is kind of like treading water, right? Sustainability is like we're not getting any worse, but we're also not getting any better. Regenerative agriculture is that idea that we can actually use livestock or cover crops or multi-species grazing to actually make the soil healthier every single year. It's something that our forefathers and before us, the Native Americans, understood very well. Partly because of this. Anybody know what, what type of animal are we looking at right here? Wildebeest. Somebody had it. I know some, you got it. Yeah. Wildebeest. Uh, millions of wildebeest in a single herd. This is in the African Serengeti. These animals aren't the fastest. They're not the strongest, and they don't have the sharpest teeth. So how do they prevent themselves from being killed? Somebody's got it, I know. I can feel it. How do these not get wiped off the face of the earth, these wildebeest? They herd. They herd up. The strength is in numbers, right? So they're going to herd up in these tight packs. What do these ruminant style animals do all day long every single day? You guys know this one. In Warren County. They eat, right? They eat. What happens after ruminants eat? Exactly. You guys know. They poop. And what happens after the grass is gone? They've eaten the feed and they've pooped on the ground. They move to the next spot. Really beautiful. Really actually very simple, but also very complex. Now when the scientists study this, they go crazy about all the biological processes that happen with this simple eat move eat, poop, and move process. But we looked at this. Nature, again, as our, as our fundamental. What kind, of, what kind of animal are we looking at here? Oh, so. Oh, so bison, exactly. Uh, anybody have an idea 
If you, if you saw my slides, or heard me talk already, don't answer this. Do you have an idea just how many bison there were in the United States 200 years ago, 500 years ago? Throw out a number. 50 million? Must be a, he must be a smart man. It's very, it's very close. From my research, we're looking at 60 to 80 million head of bison just within continental United States right here. Okay? Cattle production. Now, this is some, I'm from Southern California. I hear this every single day. I go out and I talk or I sell or I do anything. Oh, cows, they're so bad for the environment. They're causing global warming. They're doing all this horrible stuff, right? <coughs> Who knows what the national herd's at right now? Herd size. How many cows do we have in the United States? Somebody, I know. 20 million? More. 90 million. So, here's where we have to back up for a second. You guys may understand this more fundamentally than we do in California, but if you're telling me for millions of years that our country sustained, regeneratively sustained, 60 to 80 million bison, now that number's down under half a million bison in our country, by the way, but, and now you're telling me that 90 million of a smaller animal are causing all this environmental disaster. Something's not really adding up right there, right? We have the same amount of animals that we've had for a long, long time. One of my favorite authors, Diana Rogers, wrote a book called It's Not the Cow, It's the How. It's really the difference of how those wildebeest or the bison look compared to how these cattle look in this picture. It's the difference of movement, right? And that's really where we get to with regenerative agriculture. So, anybody want to take a guess what this map is? I'm going to keep asking. I'm not going to stop. Bison, bison, bison production in the United States, that's what most people typically say. That's pretty much what the map is. However, this is what's fascinating. This is purely led to both the row crop style farming, so corn, beans, sorghum, milo. This bears a striking resemblance to where the, the bison range for millions of years. What does that tell us, right? Those bison eating, pooping, and moving for many, many, whatever, thousands of years, millions of years, <coughs> Where do you think that black soil, that rich, thick, amazing young pine soil probably came from? That was those bison for a long time grazing, pooping. That, that, that manure is the best fertilizer in the entire world. Better than anything our agroscience companies can even come up with now. They produce the richest soil known to man. And that's become our farming ground now. It's that idea, again, here you go, corn. Beautiful, dark, nice row corn. And we're using the fertility that was generated for a long time before, we're leveraging that now. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's how we have such great soil in the heartland here. Who's familiar with this guy? This guy's more obscure. I'm going to be impressed if you've heard of him. You got him? Awesome. Alan Savory. Uh, similar to Joel Salton. Uh, Joel Salton would be the grandfather of sort of pasture raised, modern pasture raised livestock. Alan Savory is really the grandfather of this idea of regenerative agriculture. So he's now started to take cattle, domesticated cattle, and run them in these huge herds in very small areas, rotating rapidly to see this great landscape change. I've got some examples. This, these are real pictures, uh, not fabricated in any way. Um, these are from his foundation. So this is, he says, we're all over the world. This is using no seed, no irrigation, just increasing the livestock, the cattle stocking density, sometimes 100 times of what it was before. This is 2004. This is what it looked like in 2007. Again, I can provide sources and stuff for this, but it's during the same period of time, the same season. Average rainfall is about the same. And this is 2013. You can see the biodiversity, the increasing grasslands. It's probably the increasing wildlife. Incredible environmental regeneration, purely using livestock. Pretty incredible. Mexico, 1963. This one's really insane. Just using livestock. This looks overgrazed to a normal cattle farmer. They say, oh, that's overgrazed. Too many animals. No, it's just the rest of them. Actually, we added more animals here. Keep an eye on the arrow. 40 years later, using cattle only. Again, we're fighting climate change one way or another. It looks like things are changing. It feels like crazy wet weather happens all the time. It's 80 degrees in the middle of November. However, by using cattle, this guy's had a lot of success. Here's, here's one that says the tale of two fence lines. So you can tell a lot in farming by looking at the fence line of, of yours and the guy next to you, right? This is Savory's farm on the left. 
This is his neighbor running 10% of the cattle that he's running on the right. So again, way more animals, leading to way more forage, purely based on the way that they're running. On the right, it's continuous grazing. One cow for five acres, one cow for 10 acres. On the left, he's running the electric fence, a huge mob grazing, two cows on the ground, moving, moving, moving all the time. And you see some pretty cool reactions. So, we're driving our proverbial tractor now back to Southern California. We're going to get back to the primal pasture story. Um, we got really excited about this regenerative agriculture thing. I really wanted to do it. Uh, we have a little bit of land. I just have one problem. I have zero dollars. And uh, it's kind of tough when you try to buy cattle or try to buy sheep or try to buy anything else. So we did this thing called a Kickstarter. Uh, we raised about $60,000. Put a video together and we said, hey, we want to build a farm right here in Southern California. We want you guys, the consumers, to pay for the creation of that farm. And people really got behind it. 700 people pledged $58,000 to help get our farm up and running. That allowed us to get sheep, to get cattle, uh, to add into our little fledgling chicken enterprise that we're building on the farm. Also allowed us to add these pigs, the weirdest looking pigs you've probably ever seen, uh, the pigs that we love and we harvest for meat. Uh, so at this point, we've got chickens going, we've got pigs going, we've got sheep, we've got cows going, we've got all these cool things. And um, we ran into this interesting issue. Um, what is our purpose here? What are we supposed to be doing? We're in Southern California. Um, we actually went through and we said, what can we actually be good at? With our skill set, limited money, limited land, what can we actually be good at? What, what can we leverage here? And so we made this, literally, we made this pros and cons list back in 2013, 2014. And we looked at our geography and what the SWOT analysis was. So on the con side, land, hyper expensive. We're talking $100,000 an acre in some areas where we're farming. Uh, labor, hyper expensive. A lot of competition, a lot of jobs. Really, really tough on labor. Uh, the weather doesn't help a lot. It's super hot and super dry. Uh, the average for our first four years of farming, seven inches of rain uh, annually. So not getting a lot of help from the weather. Um, regulatory. You may think it's bad here in Morgan County. Come on out to Southern California anytime you want. I'll show you regulatory restrictions. Really, really tough um, with the government to try to get things going. That we need to go. However, that's the negative. The positive was we had 22 million people within two hours of this little farm, this little two-acre backyard farm. Uh, there were almost no other farms doing what we did, almost no competition in this pasture raised phase, and lots of expendable income. If you guys have heard real housewives of Orange County and San Diego and LA, you know there's money there, so people are willing to spend for good products. So um, we started doing farm tours. Farm tours have been absolutely fundamental to the transparency and to the market growth of our farm. We've hosted more than 18,000 people in the last three years. We literally sell tickets to people from Southern California that pay money to come and get a two-hour tour with us on our farm. They walk around. They love seeing the pigs. They love seeing the sheep outside. It's revolutionary for some of these people. I was sharing with Molly that I've, had, I've watched somebody cry because they never thought about the fact that chickens laid the eggs that they eat for breakfast every morning. They cry. It's kind of sad. Okay, it's Farm tours have been unbelievable for us. Social media. Social media has been another one that's just an absolute, hands down, so important to our business. We post photos and videos every single day on our Instagram or Facebook pages. This is the modern day equivalent to you going out and meeting your farmer. You know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, there weren't supermarkets. So you go out and you talk to the farmer, you shake their hand, you buy their product directly off their farm. Well, we're kind of regulated out of that now. But we can be really transparent and really, really open with people that are on social media. So they can come and do a little virtual farm visit with us anytime that they want to. Uh, over here, YouTube, we've had videos go, absolutely, this, this video, me talking about my story, quitting my job and starting in the chickens has 1.6 million views on it. So stuff like this is really changing the landscape of how people get to know their farmers. This is what our website looks like today. So primalpastures.com offers home delivery, pasture-raised chicken, lamb, beef, pork, honey, uh, and some even seafood uh, nationwide. So we can ship using FedEx, which is an unbelievable thing that's happened in the last 10 years, too. We able to ship meats nationwide for a really low cost. We can ship stuff in Southern California. We can ship stuff to Maine, Florida, anywhere. And so we're making these products convenient, and we're making them 
high quality. And when you can combine those two things, I think you really do have a little business on your hands. Uh, that's what boxes look like, that's Primal Patchers. And that's essentially the story of Primal Patchers. That'd be a cool story if it ended there. I think that'd be exciting and we'd be happy with this little small family business. We fed like 10,000 families, so we are having an impact. Um, but my family's always wanted to be more than that. And so I talk about these two things. So Primal Pastures is our business. It's really been grassroots and ground up. Really trying to innovate from the ground. I'll be honest, you guys might not like this comment, but in the beginning, when we got into this, we really hated Big Ag. And we thought they were the bad guys. And we thought that it was all bad. That was the culture that we sort of came up with. And, and we really didn't know any better. But we thought, all oh, these big guys are the bad guys, or this and that. And so we tried to make this thing totally outside of that supply chain. And uh, like I said, we're new to this, and we've actually been learning a lot. So our next business is actually totally different than that. So this business starts out with this guy. Any basketball fans in the house? Who knows this guy? Kobe Bryant. So the way that this business started was we were doing our home delivery, primal pastures, really cool, small scale. Um, and the LA Lakers team chef called on the phone. I said, is this really, are you serious? Lakers? Yeah. Hey, we want to come down. We spend $20 million, whatever, $50 million a year on this guy and our other guys. I think we should be feeding him the best food that we absolutely can. I said, you know what, that's actually a pretty good point. If you're investing that much money in somebody and not giving them the absolute best food you can, okay, come on down, let's talk. And so, prior to that, we've had restaurants asking, butcher shops, grocery stores, but it didn't make sense for us at that time. When the Lakers team chef came down, back when they were actually good, by the way, they're not very good anymore. Back when they were actually good, there was no way we could say no. We're a small little young company, Kobe's playing, Steve Nash is on the team, we said, absolutely, we're going to figure out how to go into the wholesale business now. Wholesale, very different than retail, it's going to be fresh, it has to be delivered to the customer, a whole different thing. So we took on the Lakers as our first ever wholesale client. Next up, as they would have it, LA's smaller than sound. The team chef of the Lakers talks to the team chef of the Dodgers, and pretty soon we have the Dodgers calling down. And the Dodgers, okay, this is just for the players, not for the whole stadium. But they're calling the world. <laughs> they're going, hey, we, we heard the Lakers got the good stuff, we want the good stuff, you know? And so pretty soon we're selling products, our pasture chicken and lamb and stuff in the Lakers and the Dodgers at the same time. We're going, we're pretty cool right now, aren't we? Okay. Awesome. But we ran into this issue. Again, I love Joel. I love what he's done. But that system doesn't scale very well. That's more labor equals more chickens. There's no way to scale it. And that system, I'm sorry, it will not feed the world. It will not feed a million people. Uh, we can feed 10,000 families painfully and very expensively. Uh, but it's not going to feed that many people. That's a labor intensive system. And so what we saw as the opportunity for now a top-down business was, let's build some technology, let's build something where the big industry can take it, and they can basically make it into their own, and leverage all that beautiful vertical integration, all the stuff the industry does really well on the cost side, on the input side. And so we started Pasture our next company. So we had Primal Pastures, which is this direct-to-consumer online meat shop, and now we're gonna do Pasture. Pasture is gonna become, what we hope, the nationwide leader in pasture shape. We wanna move more chickens to fresh pasture every day than anybody else in the country. And so we went out and we started these business plan competitions. So if any students or anybody kind of thinking about agri agripreneurship or entrepreneurship, we started with no money, right? So we had to figure out, first off, how do you get any money? Uh, we didn't want to sell stock in the business or raise equity because it was worth nothing. We would have given the whole business away. So this is actually uh, the Farm Bureau. We applied for one of the business contests, the Farm Bureau. And we, won, we didn't win the main prize, but we won the People's Choice Prize. So all the people said, oh, that's pretty cool. We won $25,000 doing that. It cost us nothing. And then we went to the Howard G. Buffett Foundation. Howard G. Buffett's a well-known farmer in Wisconsin. He had, a, he had a business plan competition. We won $50,000 there. And all of a sudden, we're sitting here with $75,000. Uh, a big idea. Granted, $75,000 is not enough to do it. But we had a big idea. It felt like a lot of money to us at the time. And we're going to go for this thing. <coughs> So, we got our valuation up a little bit, and we, found, we talked to some local investors. We found these guys that were going to invest in Pasture Group. We sold a few shares, got some extra money, and what we developed was what we thought would scale to the rest of the world and beyond. This metal version of what Joel South did. So now, instead of having to pull it with your back, you can come up with a little tractor and just push it forward every day. And we thought, this is so efficient, this is so amazing, we'll never go past it. Well, we 
basically excavated those and smashed them up into steel about six months later because we did version two and version three and version four. But that idea of really innovation around technology and around housing is what Passion was really built on. Nowadays, this is what the chicken coops look like. So as much of agriculture looks, they start to get bigger. And the bigger they got, the more efficient they got. The big idea with Passion has always been, I'm tired of producing food for rich people, people that can happen to afford it. I want to get stuff that's passion raised and real into Walmart. I want to get it into Albertson, Costco, and these places where normal people like me can actually afford it. So inside of that coop, again, it's just a greenhouse. It sits up on skids. There's 600 birds inside of there. They're foraging and eating grasses and bugs and seeds and worms. You can see the little feeders in there. You can see the little waters in there. So it's basically a little miniature broiler house that moves every single day. And I think I actually have a video of it. This is our farm in San Diego County right now. You can see we've replicated this. You see lots of those 600 bird coops now in the background. Nowadays, we're producing about 6,000 birds every single week. Uh, for restaurant wholesale markets in Southern California. It doesn't sound like a big number, but we're by about five times the biggest in the country that's doing things this way. So, yeah, we're the tallest midget, we're still the tallest, right? Um, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. So that tractor basically goes around pulls every one of those coops every single day to fresh pasture. Um, something really fun happened in 2018. We went on national TV. CNBC, there's a show called The Billion Dollar Buyer. Uh, this guy Tillman for Tita is the largest restaurant tour in the country, and he heard about our story and he said, "I want your chickens for our restaurant." And so he came out. The whole thing was televised. Um, and this right here, this scene was the single most nerve-wracking moment in my entire business life so far because it was a blind taste test. And so we sort of pre-negotiated the story and figured all this stuff out. But they sprung this on us it was a surprise. And said, "Okay, I like the product. The price is okay, but it has to taste better." And that's the moment where we really freak out, right? Because we're producing this for environmental benefit and all these other things, but does it actually taste better? So we put on the blindfolds, cameras are rolling, you can't see it here, but I'm sweating, I'm so nervous, what's going to happen with this? And yes, I believe in the product, but I don't know, I don't know what's going to turn out. Sure enough, they ended up choosing our product 9 to 3 against the conventional or the organic chicken. And what everybody says about the pasture raised chicken is, Man, it tastes like chicken used to 50 years ago. Or people that grew up outside of the country, they say, Man, that tastes like chicken back in Mexico. That chicken actually has muscle fiber to it. It has density to it. It doesn't taste like you're eating a sponge. It has some actual form to it. And we hear that constantly. Or people that grew up on farms that go, that tastes like my grandma's chicken, the yard bird that was out back running around, and she went and harvested it. That tastes like that chicken, you know? Because they're not just sitting there eating corn soybeans their whole life. They're foraging, they're running around, they're moving, they're doing a lot of other things. That's a good tasting bird, love them. And so he basically put in a quarter million dollar order with us, and we filled that order over about a year period. It helped us continue to grow. Having that kind of demand was pretty awesome. Um, started getting local press. We got a lot of newspapers. The San Diego County Tribune wrote about us. Uh, AOL wrote about us. Huffington Post wrote about us. We started picking up some steam in the media. That was really, really important to us. <clears throat> Here's a little video of what the farm looks like today. So this was taken just a little while ago. Um, it's about 40 seconds. That's the inside of the food. So we do a lot of soil sampling. And I want to see 
that every single year my soil organic matter is increasing. I'm going to show you why that matters. So this is two soil samples. One we pull from an area that we farmed on the left. One we pull from an area that has not been farmed on the right. This gets fun in a minute. If you're a dork like me, it'll get fun. We pull out what the soil organic matter is after one year. So you can see in the farmed area, we got up to 3.2. In the area that's not farmed, it's sitting down at 2.1. Who cares? Here's the stack. So follow me on this for a second. This gets really fun. For every 1% that you can increase that soil organic matter, you can retain an additional 25,000 gallons of water per acre. We've increased 1% in two years. That's an okay number. But there's people out there using beef cattle that have increased 6%. I'm going to show you what this means just by a 1% increase on our farm in this last year. So every time it rains, on 165 acres, we're going to capture an additional 4 million gallons of water. Now, instead of the water hitting that soil and running off in the local streams, rivers, or anywhere else, it's going to stay on the farm. It's going to sink into the ground. We had eight storms this year. So what that results in is 32 million additional gallons of water staying on the farm instead of running off. That's one example of what healthy soil does. Now, it generated a problem for us, though. So now, all of a sudden, we had way too much grass. Chickens don't like really tall grass. If you think about it in nature, Poultry will always follow behind big ruminant animals. So if you go back to that example of Serengeti, or if you look at bison, look at planet Earth, you know, one of my favorite TV shows, you always see these birds coming in behind the, the, the cattle or the bison or the big animals. Because when the, when the beef cattle eat that grass, they chop it off and they expose all those fresh bugs and worms, stuff the chickens absolutely go nuts for. And so what we had to do was either make a decision. We're going to either have to mow this grass or we can use livestock to basically graze it. And so this year, for the first time in five years, we have always wanted to do this. We didn't have enough grass in it. This is really low organic matter when we started. But this is the cattle, our 40 head of cattle, which we hope becomes 4,000 head of cattle next time we come talk to you guys, um, grazing in front of the chicken coops. So these chicken coops are all going to move this, direct, or this direction. Uh, and basically, we're using the electric fencing. You can see this electric fencing right here. We're basically going to pulse them in this one spot real hard. We're going to move them off the next day. And you can see the cattle literally mowing for us, doing the work of getting a tractor out and implements and all this stuff. The John Deere guys don't like this slide too much because we don't want the implements. And we're using the cattle to do that job for us. And what are they doing while they're doing that? They're getting fat. And that becomes a good beef that we can sell on the market as an additional income stream, too. So, one of the things we get super excited about is that idea of stacking using. That same amount of land, same, same footprint to do beef, cattle, poultry, hogs, sheep, it all really goes together. And if you look again at nature as a template, there's never mono crops in nature. Always multiple species, multiple plants, multiple different kinds of animals. And that's what we're kind of trying to work for. Um, this slide, I actually don't want to do too much of it. I'm going to do a few seconds of it, but it's a lot of fun. Um, we work with some of the best chefs in all of California. This is Brian Malarkey. He's probably one of the most well-known chefs in all of San Diego. He came down and shot a video. Um, this is just basically an example of transparency and some of the marketing that we do on our farm. People say, don't eat chicken. Oh, I can make chicken at home. You haven't tried Urban Woods Chicken. Urban Woods we source the best possible chicken we can find and put a whole new unique spin on it and took it to a whole new level. At Urban Wood, every dish on our menu tells a story. And we want to tell the story about people who are doing it right. So when we sourced our chicken for our chicken dish, we went to Pastureburg Farm. This farm is local, and we moved the chickens around the field so they're eating clean, they're living clean, and you can see the amazing, amazing loving characters of each and every one of these birds. This is what we need to be doing as a society to make sure that we're sustainable and responsible citizens of Earth. I'm going to end it there. He goes into some really cool recipes and stuff like that. But it's just an example of the marketing that we really pursue, that ultra, uber transparency, right? So we want you to show pictures and videos from inside of our actual real chicken coops. In that video, the grass was kind of dry. It wasn't that beautiful green lush grass. This day and age, though, people want to see the real deal. So we want to show all seasons. We want to show our areas where we're still improving and the areas where we feel like we're doing a good job. We want to show everything. And the consumers really start to respond to that for us. So 
Uh, I'm just going to show kind of in summary where we're at. This is my family on the farm. We've got my wife Lindsay, our three little ones. It's an amazing environment to raise these kids. Uh, I'm just going to make the comment very quickly that um, we have a real crisis on our hands in, in American farming right now. It's, it's becoming harder and harder to find people to take over the family farm. More, more now than ever before, you have people leaving uh, the rural lifestyle to that city life, and the average age of a farmer is up to 65 years old right now. I'm not saying that what we do is the answer to that by any means, but I think it's one step in the right direction. My kids are so excited to come back and take over the farm. It smells good, it looks good, it's a lot of fun, it's a really great environment for them. They see bald eagles and deer and wildlife and all kinds of beautiful stuff every single day, and I'm really excited and passionate to be able to pass it on to them someday. Uh, what I want to end with is my, my opinion, the top five trends that I'm looking out for in 2020 as far as food and agriculture is concerned. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on any of these. I'm going to kind of go through them quick, but I wanted to leave you guys with at least something to be looking out for. For those of you guys that are agropreneurs, and that could be already working for a company and starting your own company, these are areas that I think from being on the ground and really uh, a hotbed of consumer you know, noise. Uh, I think that these are things that are going to prevail in 2020 and probably even beyond that. Um, number one, livestock production is so right right now. And I'm not just saying that because I'm in the business. Who's heard of the lab growing meat stuff that's happening? Or cell growing meat, or fake meat, we like to call it. I would be willing to guess that 90% of the town is focused on that right now. So when you go to Harvard, you go to Yale, you go to these amazing research institutions, they're completely taking their eye off the ball when it comes to livestock production, and they're focusing almost exclusively on this lab-grown meat stuff. And I don't have a problem with lab-grown meat. I actually think it's a good sign of things to come for us. It's an alternative meat. It's, a, it's okay. I, I really don't have a problem. I don't really want to eat it. But I don't have a problem with people focusing on it. My point with that, though, is I think people have taken their eye off the ball with innovating within livestock production, and there's never been a time like now to be able to actually apply some of the skills that you have into that space, into that vertical. Number two, fulfillment. So there's a stat going around right now. 18% of groceries are currently bought online, home delivery. In the next 10 years, that number is supposed to go up to 78%. Can you imagine what that's going to do for fulfillment, for grocery, for frozen foods, for FedEx? The cost advantages are going to come from autonomous trucking and vehicles being able to deliver food to your doorstep. Now is the time. Don't wait 10 years and look back at this and go, oh, Farmer Paul told me that was going to be a good space. That space is absolutely right for business, for growth, for creativity. Uh, unbelievable shift of consumer buying habits. I think more than any time in history is going to happen in the next 10 years, and that's around people ordering food for home delivery. Number three, old becoming new again. Again, we like to call this stuff pasture-raised, regenerative, cage-free, free-range. Some of you old-timers in the room, or at least if not you, your parents would have said, that's chicken and eggs. What are you talking about? You know, we're not doing anything fancy. We're not doing anything sexy. This is only replicating what was already done 100 years ago. That's a big trend in food right now, simplifying it, bringing the old, making it new again, actually pronounceable real food ingredients, really looking at that as a starting point. Um, that's, a, that's a huge trend that's happening right now. Your grandmother was on to something. That's what that's my quote right now. Number four, regenerative ag. We've spent plenty of time talking about that. That applies to every vertical though. So that's livestock, that's crop production, that's produce. Anything can benefit from the idea of helping the soil increasing fertility every single year. You can use it. I'm really passionate and excited right now about the integration of corn and, and cattle. I think that one's going to rock. Again, it's stuff that we've already done for a long time. And farmers did 100 years ago that we've gone a little bit away from. I think it's going to come back in spades. Last, but definitely not least, is that idea of traceability. So the younger folks know what I'm talking about when I say blockchain. Um, blockchain is going to completely rock the ability to trace from the package back to the actual farm where stuff came from. Um, I fully predict stuff like live streams. So you can walk into a grocery store, you can hit a QR code, and it's going to take you to a live stream on that actual farm. That stuff's not that far away. The tech is actually all there already. It's just about building it out. So really figuring out traceability. Again, 
I don't know what the average age of the room is, but the younger folks in here demand transparency. They demand to know where the food's coming from. It's not a nice to have anymore. These younger people, and maybe even younger in, than, than this room, um, they are going to demand to know where their food comes from, and they're going to want to know the farm. So I think that's, that's my last point on that. Let me see my time. We're at 46. I went a minute over. But I would love to answer any questions, and uh, nothing's off limits. Uh, if I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. That's probably a good likelihood, but I would love to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you. I love that question. If 
you didn't hear, I'm going to repeat it and shout it from the rooftop. Do you think it's possible for big companies to transition into something that looks more like what we have here? And my answer is like a resounding yes. Um, we're talking to these guys, and they're super interested. Here's what big companies do. I think you guys get this, because this is more of an ag audience than I typically talk to. When I talk to folks in Southern California, they can't stand big ag, they think they're the worst and all this stuff. Now we're at the point where I've, where I've really learned, big ag responds to customer demand. For a long time in our country, the customers have asked for cheap food, and farmers have done an amazing job of providing them with cheap food. And so now, as the consumer shifts into asking, yeah, we want it cheap, but we want quality, too. We want, if, if the consumer starts saying, we want pasture-raised chicken, well, guess what? The big companies aren't stupid people. They're going to say, okay, let's figure out how to do pasture-raised chicken. Let's, let's offer what the consumer wants. So, uh, yes, they can. The question of if they will or not comes down to consumers asking for it. And that really means voting with your dollar, and voting with your fork, and voting with the ballot. Uh, it's not a simple way on how to get these people to shift, but definitely they're not going to do it if consumers don't want it. I can guarantee you that. So chickens lay eggs. You have to talk to you about the eggs. What happens to the eggs? Broiler chickens are actually harvested before they lay eggs. So our, our main business is broilers. We'll typically harvest a six to eight weeks, somewhere in there, well before they lay eggs. We're actually pioneering the same system. So uh, we throw 400 layers inside of that same coop. Pull them every day to fresh pasture, and they lay some of their dark, beautiful yellow, orange yolks, you know, the tastiest eggs that you've ever had. And uh, that's what a real egg is supposed to taste like, by the way. Uh, we're not crazy. We don't produce really tasty food. I think that the indoor, kind of stationary areas, they just don't produce as tasty. So, um, yeah, it really does make them amazing eggs. When the chickens get, everybody knows chickens are not vegetarians, right? So the idea that we promote this vegetarian fed chicken. Uh, it's actually really sad. Chickens don't want to eat vegetarian. They want to go out and eat bugs and worms, right? That's the, the early bird hits the worm. That's saying they're around forever. Um, so when they get access to that stuff, they really, really thrive, and the, the product shows at the end, too. How do you handle the uh, necessity of having a certain amount of antibiotics in industry? In the what? I didn't totally understand the question first. The question is, how do you handle how much antibiotics need to be produced in a big industrial system? So say, all of a sudden one day we're moving a million birds a week, or 10 million birds a week. What does the antibiotic world look like at that point? My honest answer, I don't know. There's no way I can predict the future or tell the future, but what I can say is so far, we've raised about 2 million birds. We run the same stocking density, no matter the size of the food, we run the same stocking density, so same amount of square foot per bird, and we move it to fresh pasture every single day. That model replicates. I don't care if there's a million birds under that management program or 10 birds under that management program. It's the same as far as the chicken's concerned. So far, we have to use a single vaccine, a single antibiotic, a single drug, a single ionophore. There hasn't been a single synthetic chemical that's gone into that animal for health purposes or the preventative or reactive yet. And I'm not saying I'm not actually against antibiotic use. I'm actually for it. If the animals are sick, they should be treated, in my opinion. We just haven't had sick animals yet. And every farmer talks about, okay, well, you'll get them eventually. Don't worry, you'll get them. And maybe that's true. That's fine. But so far, using our system of fresh pastures, so again, getting birds off of their manure, getting them fresher and sunshine. People ask, what's your health program? What kind of drugs are you using? What are you doing? And they go, our drugs are fresh air and sunshine and fresh litter every single day. Some of you guys maybe raised poultry before. Imagine what it could look like if you have fresh litter every single day. The farm, it does not stink. When you walk out to this farm, and we've got 50,000 birds on the ranch and about 200 acres, it does not stink. And that's because the manure is going down in a controlled load onto the soil and then move it the next spot. So there's never an over an excess of nutrients in one single spot. It doesn't have that smell. Um, I don't know. That's, that's the long, the, this is the short answer to your question. What does it look like in a million birds? I hope that we can, at a minimum, reduce the antibiotics required through this management process. My real dream in the back of my head is can we eliminate them altogether? That'd be amazing. But I think time will tell them that. I'm, I'm not, at one point I would have answered the question, we'll never get antibiotics. I think I've learned enough now. Uh, I would never say that because uh, 
that's way too naive of a comment, but if we can even reduce antibiotics, that's a huge step to get into it. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward, but does your company hold like sole ownership over the like, technology, the side of foods that you have a patent on them? Yes, we do. Yep.